Okay, let's do some repeated measures ANOVA classwork. So I've got two problems here for you that we'll step through just like we did in the lecture example. All right, so in the first example, we're going to use that same data set uh, from the lecture video. Uh, this time we wish to explore if body mass index, or BMI, changes over three years for children and adolescents with visual impairments. All right, and so again, the first thing we want to do is start with our assumptions, all right, and seeing if they're met. So we're going to enter all three variables in descriptive stats, and we're going to check Shapiro-Wilk and box plot and label those outliers, all right? And so we're going to look at a p-value for Shapiro-Wilk, and we're going to look at our box plots for outliers. So let's go over to, I'm going to keep that there, let's go over to JASP, and we want descriptives, and this time we're going to put in BMI. All right, we're going to go under statistics and check Shapiro-Wilk, and we're going to go under customizable plots and check box plots and label outliers. All right, so as we wait for our box plots to come up, all right, so we've got our descriptives here, all right, and we can look at the p-value of the Shapiro-Wilk test. So for time one, 0.394, for time two, 0.392, and for time three, 0.231. So all three are greater than 0.05. So this tells us that we can assume normality at each time point. All right, and we can look at our box plots. We have no outliers at time one, no outliers at time two, and no outliers at time three. So we can move forward with our repeated measures ANOVA, knowing that we do not have any outliers and we have normality at each time point. The only assumption that remains to be checked is sphericity, which we will do in our repeated measures ANOVA. All right, so now we wanna go to repeated measures ANOVA. All right, so let's go to our repeated measures ANOVA. All right, and again, we've got year one, year two, and year three. All right, and we'll take our three BMI measures and put them in the repeated measure cells. All right, we're gonna go down here and check descriptive statistics, estimates of effect size, uncheck eta squared and check omega squared. And under assumption checks, we are going to check sphericity tests and both corrections. All right, and so again, we've got our omnibus test here in the first table. Uh, we've got our descriptives and we've got our test of sphericity. So let's take a look at our, I'm gonna, oops. Let's see here. both of these up on the same. Okay, so let's take a look at sphericity first. And so we see uh, that our p-value for Mockley's W is 0 0.022. So this, this time, all right, uh, we do have sphericity being violated, all right? So we wanna look over at our two epsilon corrections and notice both of these are greater than 0 0.7, all right? So we can interpret the corrected results for either the greenhouse geyser or the Hyunfeld, all right? And we are going to choose the greenhouse geyser, all right? So let's go up to our omnibus test, all right? And for the repeated measures factor one, we're gonna look at our greenhouse geyser row and we're gonna go over and we see an F statistic of 8.173 and a P value of 0 0.002, all right? So since this P value is less than 0 0.002, we, can re we will reject the null hypothesis, all right? So again, what is this omnibus test telling us? It's telling us that at least one year has a BMI average that's significantly different from the others at the, in the population. All right, and now because we have a significant p-value here, we can look over at our omega squared, our effect size, and we see 0 0.035, all right? And omega squared is interpreted like eta squared, all right, where 0 0.01 is small, 0 0.06 is medium, and 0 0.14 is large, 
All right, and so here we see an effect size of 0.035, and so we would interpret that as small to medium. All right, so now since we have, and let's make this bigger, all right, so now we have significant results for the omnibus test. But again, that doesn't tell us a whole lot, right? We want to be able to see what actually differs. Is it year one and year two? Is it year one and year three? What actually differs here? So we want to go down to our post hoc tests. We want to move the RM factor one over to the box on the right. Uncheck pool error term for repeated measure factors. Check effect size and check Bonferroni. And I'm, for this example, I'm going to leave home checked, uh, just, just so you can see. Also, under descriptive plots, let's move the RM factor 1 to the horizontal axis. Okay, so let's go down and take a look at our post hoc test table. And as we're looking at our post hoc test table, let's also uh, take a look here at our descriptive plots. So descriptively, we're seeing that the BMI uh, is lowest in year one, it goes up some in year two, and then it really seems to go up in year three. Um, and we can add error bars, all right? So this would be a 95% confidence interval. Um, ho hopefully you remember that when our error bars or confidence intervals overlap, we do not see a significant difference. And so we can go down here in our post hoc test table and look at year one and year two, the difference in year one and year two. The mean difference is negative 0.457. And we see a Bonferroni p-value of close to one. Now remember, this is not exactly one. It just means infinitely close to one. All right, and we see a home p-value of 0.445. While they don't agree in number, they certainly do agree in significance. All right, and so what this is saying, this p-value is saying, is that year one and year two do not significantly differ. And of course, we see that in our plot here by the overlapping error bars. All right, now let's take a look at year three. So we've got year three up here, and it we can't exactly tell if it overlaps with year two. It's so close. Um, probably, I'm going to say, I don't think it overlaps with year two, and it certainly doesn't overlap with year one. So going into the post hoc table, I'm expecting to see a significant p-value with the two comparisons to year three. So let's go down to our post hoc table, and I see year one compared to year three. That mean difference is negative 1.904. And we see a, P, a Bonferroni p-value of less than 0 0.001 and a Holmes p-value of less than 0 0.001. So here they numerically agree, and they certainly agree on significance. So the means of year one and year three are significantly different. We can also look at year two, all right, compared to year three, and we see a mean difference of negative 1.447. And we can go over to our p-values and see the Bonferroni p-value of 0 0.003 and the home p-value of 0 0.002. Again, they do not quite agree numerically, but again, they certainly agree on significance. All right, and so what we see here, all right, overall, is that the BMI average in year three is significantly different from the BMI average in years one and year two, all right, but years one and two do not significantly differ. All right, so, all right, so how do we report these results? So let's, let's blow this slide up. All right, and so we've got Mockley's test of sphericity showed a significant difference in variation between the group differences. And so again, I report that W value with two degrees of freedom is 0.781 with the p-value of 0 0.022, all right? Therefore, the greenhouse geyser correction was used. This showed that BMI differed significantly, this being the greenhouse geyser correction in the omnibus test, showed that B BMI differed significantly between the time points, all right? So let's go back for a second because I wanna make sure you know where these numbers are coming from. So we're gonna go back to our omnibus table and we are going to report 
the F value for the greenhouse geyser, which is 8.173. All right, our degrees of freedom for the repeated measures factors, 1.640, and our residual degrees of freedom is 52.492. All right, we also report the P value equal to 0 0.002, and we report omega squared. All right, and again, this effect size is suggesting a small to medium effect. Post hoc testing using the Bonferroni correction revealed that BMI increased significantly in the third year, but not in the first two years. All right, and so I report years one compared to two, and that was our non-significant year. I report years one to three, which is a significant difference and years two to three, which is a significant difference. And here we are reporting the mean difference, the standard error, and the p-value, and I'll go back to Jasp for a second, from this post hoc table. So again, we report the mean difference, the standard error, and the Bonferroni p-value. Okay. All right, let's do one more example. All right, so this time we're going to use a different data set. We're going to use preschoolmotor.csv. And in this, we implemented an intervention with teachers to deliver a curriculum that develops social emotional skills in preschoolers. We have measurements of social skills before and after the intervention and at the start of the following school year. All right, so again, we're going to start with our assumptions. So uh, let me minimize this JASP and open up our other JASP. All right, so we've got preschool motor here. And we're going to start with descriptives. All right, and here are my social skills, year one pre-intervention, year one post-intervention, and year two. So I'm going to select them, put them in my variables box. I'm going to check Shapiro Wilk, and I am going to check box plots, and label outliers. All right, so first and foremost, let's look at our p-values of Shapiro-Wilk, and we see 0 0.223, 0 0.169, and 0 0.108. They are all greater than 0 0.05, so our assumption of normality is met. All right, we can look at our box plots. No outliers prior to the intervention in year one. No outliers post-intervention year one and no outliers at the beginning of year two. So we have no outliers, we have normality at each of the three time points. So we're gonna move forward with our repeated measures ANOVA knowing that we still need to check sphericity. All right, so I'm gonna to go to repeated measures ANOVA and I'm gonna change this pre year one, post year one, and this will be year two. All right, and I'm going to go to my social skills, and I'm going to put them in my repeated measure cells, check descriptive statistics, check estimates of effect size, uncheck eta squared because I want omega squared, and I'm going to check uh, my assumption check for the sphericity tests. All right, so make sure. All right, so let's go now to sphericity. All right, and here we see a Mockley's W of 0.621, and that p-value is less than 0.001. So sphericity has been violated. The question is, is one of the epsilon corrections um, can, uh, large enough or close enough to one so that we can interpret that correction? And the answer is yes. Uh, both are greater than 0.7. So we can go up here into our omnibus table and we can interpret the p-value for one of these corrections. Like last time, I'm gonna choose greenhouse geyser um, in terms of the omnibus test. So we look at the repeated measures factor one for the greenhouse geyser correction and we see an F statistic of 101.144 with a p-value less than 0.001. All right, so what is this saying? This is saying that we reject the null hypothesis and at least one time period has a social skill average score that is significantly different from the others. 
we see an omega squared of 0.027, which is telling us there's a small to medium effect, probably a little bit closer to, um, interpreted a little bit closer than to small. All right, but we do have a significant p-value here, which means that we do want to look at the post hoc test. So we're going to go over here to our post hoc tests. We're going to move the repeated measures factor over, uncheck pool error term, check effect size, check Bonferroni, and I'm going to go ahead and uncheck home this time since we're just really interested in the Bonferroni correction. I'm also going to go to descriptive plots and I'm going to move the repeated measures factor over to the horizontal axis and I'm going to um, ask the, it to display error bars. Okay, so let's just take a look here. Again, I just want to make sure you guys understand error bars and understand graphs. And sometimes I think the graphs might be a little bit easier to interpret than the tables themselves. So we see um, our 95% confidence intervals with the error bars. We see that they overlap in post year one and year two, but we see that pre year one is uh, not overlapping and much lower down here. So it looks like on the surface before we interpret anything, it looks like social skills definitely increase across the intervention and they just seem to stay at that level um, through the start of the following year. All right, so what do we see when we look at pre year one to post year one? All right, we see a Bonferroni p-value of less than 0 0.001 uh, from pre-year one to year, the beginning of year two. We also see a Bonferroni p-value of less than 0 0.001. But then from post-intervention, year, post year one, to the beginning of year two, we do not see a significant p-value. All right, so again, these the p-values match what we're seeing in terms of the overlapping error bars for the 95% confidence interval. All right, so how do we interpret this? And let's go current slide. Okay, Mockley's test of sphericity showed a significant difference in variation between the group differences. Again, we report W with the degrees of freedom of 2 with the value of W of 0.621 and a p-value less than 0 0.001. Therefore, the greenhouse geyser correction was used. This showed that social skills differed significantly between time points. So looking at the greenhouse geyser row in the omnibus test, we report the F statistic, which is 101.144. All right, and we report the RM factor one degrees of freedom for the greenhouse geyser correction, which is 1.45. And then the greenhouse geyser degrees of freedom for the residuals, which is 144.998. We also report the p-value less than 0 0.001, and we report omega squared, which is 0.027 suggesting that this is a small to medium effect, although I might argue it's a little bit closer just to just small. All right, uh, post hoc testing using the Bonferroni correction revealed that social skills increased significantly after the intervention and remained at this higher value through the start of the following school year. And then we report those pairwise differences and we report the mean difference, we report the standard error, and we report the p-values. So we report year one pre-intervention with year one post-intervention. We report that mean difference, the standard error, and the p-value less than 0 0.001. We do the same for year one pre-intervention to year two, where we get that, um, again, those significant results with the p-value less than 0 0.001. And then lastly, we present the results for year one post to year two, which was our non-significant results uh, because the social skills just kind of stayed at the same level they were at post-intervention. All right, at this point, I think you are ready for the homework problems.